love the message that God has given me today. It's called Come and Drink. Let's turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. In this chapter, the people had many different reactions toward Jesus. You know, when he walked the earth, not everybody received him. You all know the story. That's why they crucified him. They didn't like the fact that people were following him. The religious crowd was envious. The Bible says it was for envy that they crucified him. But in this chapter, we start to see that many people had different reactions about Jesus. Some called him a good man, the Messiah, the prophet who's coming, who had been predicted by Moses. Others called him a fraud, demon-possessed, and a false teacher. Even his brothers, we learn about in this chapter, chapter 7, had a difficult time believing in him. Because of Jesus' virgin birth, they were only half-brothers, right? Mary, not Joseph, was Jesus' only human parent. And we read that in the scriptures. But some of these brothers would eventually become leaders in the church, but for several years they were embarrassed by Jesus. In fact, you read this in this chapter. We're going to see that in a moment. The Gospel of Matthew lists Jesus' brothers as James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. I realize that this is opposite from what the Catholic Church may have taught you if you grew up in Catholic Church, which I did, because we were taught that it was Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, where this is not true. The scriptures bore it out that she had children. She, after Jesus was born, the Bible talks about how Joseph knew her, and then she had other children. Jesus has had brothers. After he died and rose again, they finally believed. In fact, James authored the New Testament epistle that bears his name and also, and he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And Judas also, also called Jude, that's another name for that name, Judas, wrote the epistle that bears his name. That's that gospel, that little epistle right before the book of Revelation. But because the world hated Jesus, we who follow him can expect that some people are going to hate us as well. Sometimes when people manifest, you don't really know why, but a lot of behind all of it is if the devil is motivating them, they can't handle the Jesus that's in you. Amen. Just like when Jesus walked the earth, the, 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 the demons cried out, why have you come to torment us? Well, the Jesus in you will, will bring about a manifestation in people that don't know him. Amen. But that's okay. That's how they come to know him. They start questioning, why am I reacting this way? And then we pray for them and... Pretty soon they get born again. Amen. That's the plan, amen? amen? Let's read John chapter 7, verse 1 through 8. I'm going to read in the NLT. That's the New Living Translation. It says, After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, and Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. They said it with sarcasm. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, even his brothers didn't believe in him. Verse 6, now is not, Jesus replied, now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go anytime. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on, but I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. Some translation says I'm not going yet because we learned that he did eventually go. That This chapter talks about that. You see, Jesus and his brothers were referring to this Feast of Tabernacles. I taught about this many months back in the, the Wednesday night, but the Lord wanted me to bring out just a portion of that and to enlarge upon it too so we can see some things about how important it is for us to come and drink. Amen. You know, and Wednesday night, we got a drinking section, I got to tell you. <laughs> they regularly drink, and, and they have the effect of, of what drinkers have. They get drunk in the Holy Ghost many times on a Wednesday night. So it's important that you know that you need to come and drink, participate. Amen? Amen. And it's something about drinkers. I'm telling you what. Even in the natural with alcohol, they always want you to drink with them. Well, I'm like that. I'm drunk with the Holy Ghost most of the time, and I want everybody else drunk with me. 
I remember before I got born again, and Jesse was always a drinker. Y'all have heard his testimony. I never did drink. I didn't like it. I was never attracted to it. My father was an, al was an alcoholic. He was always either drunk or my stepfather, a second one. My mother married four times. Some of them, two of them were really heavy drinkers. It never was attractive to me. And, uh, but I remember I would go around places with Jesse, and they'd all want me to drink with them. And I got tired of saying, no, I don't want anything. After a while, I'll just grab a, ca a can of beer. So I just held it. I didn't like it. I just, just so they'd shut up. <laughs> that's something about people who drink. They want you to participate with them. Yes. Well, that's why those of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit yes. and, and drunk on God, if you want to call it that way, yes. we want everybody else to experience it because yes. it's a good life. And you're not going to have a hangover. You're not going to have do things you don't think you should have done. Yes. It's something about living for God and experiencing him. And this is what Jesus is going to say. We're going to read this later in this chapter. It's so important that you realize that God really was, does want you to come. Jesus came so that you can come Amen. and drink yes. of him. You can ref re be refreshed. You can receive everything that you need in this life. Amen. Anybody interested in doing that? Yes. Hallelujah. I know I'm in the right house. Those of you that are watching online, you can participate as well. And, and it's, it's full of good things that you can enjoy. Amen. In God's word. But this is, he was talking about the festival of tabernacles. And it's described in Leviticus chapter 23. We're not going to go there. But this is, was one of the three annual events that the people and the families all came to. And it occurred about six months after the Passover celebration. It commemorated the days when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and they lived in shelters or booths. You may have heard it called the Festival of Booths or uh, Sakut, I think it's, they call it. Something like that. I look to Betty because she's like my go-to. <laughs> she helps keep me straight sometimes. Don't blame it all on her though. <laughs> it's not her fault. <laughs> Hallelujah. But everyone at this festival was walking and around and talking about Jesus. They were looking for him. But when it came time to speak up for him in public, most of them didn't say a word. Why? Because they were all afraid. They knew what the leaders, the Jewish leaders or the Pharisees thought. And they knew that if they spoke up and were openly uh, vocal about him, they could risk being excommunicated from the temple, and nobody really wanted that. So they, a lot of them were quiet. This is why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And there are, there's another story you'll read in John chapter 9 where the uh, parents of the man who Jesus had healed, who uh, they, the Pharisees, the rulers asked them, what about your son? Was he, was he always this way? Because they, they had a big investigation when Jesus healed that man that was paralyzed from birth. And so he said, was it, was it paralyzed? Blind. Blind. I knew I was wrong. Thank you. The, the, I wasn't, it wasn't in my nose, but I knew, I knew that Jesus had to, to explain this because he had been blind from birth. And the Pharisees were asking the parents, and they said, well, you ask him. Well, he's a grown man. He's 40-something years old. Why don't you just ask him? Well, they didn't want to answer because it says in the scriptures that they feared them, that they would be excommunicated in their own son. An amazing miracle. What this is what legalism and, and uh, well, fanaticism like that will do to you. It'll, it'll bind you and silence you. We know a lot about cancel culture today, don't we? But we can't allow things to silence our voice. We have a voice. But at this festival, everybody was looking for him. And these Jewish leaders had a great deal of power over these common people. That's why they didn't want to, to speak up about Jesus. But most of the people were probably not aware of the plot to kill Jesus. And we've read that, that really started in John chapter 5. There was a small group of people looking for the right opportunity to kill him. But the majority of people were trying to decide what they believed about him. So Jesus went secretly to this Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem and he taught in the temple. And then let's go to verse 37. We're going to read some things and discover some things today. Because on the last day, the great day of the feast, the eighth day, Jesus made a public declaration. Verse 37, it's going to read John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39, through 39. It says, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. 
Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him, but the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. This eighth day is significant. This eighth day is such a special time. It just, it, it indicates infinity. It indicates, uh, this is something significant of this day. This eighth day of the feast was, feast was also a Sabbath. So on, during this feast, they actually had two Sabbaths. And the last feast day of the year was distinguished by many remarkable ceremonies. Now this was so significant because at the very moment that Jesus stood up and made this declaration, which we just read, where he said, if anyone who believes in me may come and drink, anyone who believes in me may come and drink, and rivers of living water will flow from his heart. One translation talks about flowing from his innermost being, from his belly. This is a refreshing that comes from God when you receive him and accept him, amen? And the very moment that Jesus stood up and made this statement is so significant because this was here it was at the end of this festival and they were, they would regularly, there was a priest that would go down and he would grow, grab a golden pitcher from this pool of Siloam and he would fill it up and he would come up and the people would make a circle around the, um, the, uh, in the temple, they would make a circle and they would pour the water out. And so this was a very significant moment when he stood up. It just wasn't a quiet thing. The people of that day knew that he was comparing himself to this living water. And they knew that he was declaring himself to be the Messiah. So it was so very significant. And they had heard him, the the Messiah, the Son of God, come there that day in the temple and declare it. This was a significant celebration. One commentary On this verse says, the generally joyous character of this feast broke out on this day in loud jubilation, particularly at the solemn moment when the priest was, which was done on every day of this festival, brought forth a golden vessel, water from the stream of Silo, Siloam, which flowed under the temple mountain and solemnly poured it on the altar. And the, then uh, we're going to read Isaiah in a moment, but this is what it says, how this is what so many things were done symbolically. So they knew that this was a, a, a defining moment when Jesus was revealing to them who he was. So Jesus uh, did an amazing thing. Uh, Somebody, another commentary I wrote, it says, so ecstatic was the joy with, with which this ceremony was performed. It was accompanied with the sound of trumpets, and, that, and it used to be said that who had not wis- witnessed it had never seen rejoicing at all. So these people really knew how to get down <laughs> with a bad self, as we say. So they were such rejoicing and trumpets were playing and the, it was a great festive celebration. And Jesus stood up and said, anybody that's thirsty, come and drink and you're going to receive living water. I know that clip really strengthened your faith. And at Covenant Church, you'll learn to walk in faith each and every day. That's why we want you to come and join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for anointed worship and an on-time word. If you're a part of our global audience and watch our Sunday services online, let us know and email us at partnercare at jdm.org. We want to connect with you. Thanks again for watching. And remember, together we're reaching people and changing lives one soul at a time. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.